we humans the owners of this planet? Are the mountains ours, the seas, the rivers? Or are we stewards to the earth? Or are we partners to all animals, to all plants, to all that lives? Or are we simply part of nature? Now, you may say, no, these are interesting philosophical questions that should be answered in academic classrooms. They do not really concern me. That would be a serious misconception. It is crucial that each and every one of us considers our attitude to nature. And now, more so than ever before. We live in extraordinary times. Global crises are unfolding that threaten our future. There's an alarming decrease in biodiversity. Even within the duration of this talk, it's quite likely that, again, another plant or animal species has become extinct through human impact. And then there is the human-induced change in climate, which will affect all life forms on this planet. There's no doubt that unless we change the way in which we treat the Earth, our home, that we're seriously endangering our own well-being and the well-being of all life on this planet. Now, the way in which we treat, the way in which we treat the Earth that is connected to the image that we have of ourselves in this world, the image of the human nature relationship, or we could say it is connected to who we think we are. And we all have a certain image of the human nature relationship, and certain attitude to nature. And that attitude is formed during our lives and has two basic roots. One root is our personal life history. It makes a difference whether you're born in the city or in the countryside, because that determines whether you come into contact, contact with nature and how you come into contact with nature. I myself was born in a small village in the south of the Netherlands, surrounded by woodlands, surrounded by heathlands, and all my childhood, every free hour, I spent in nature. And that had a great impact on me. I still vividly remember the call of the cuckoo on a summer afternoon, or the, the fragrance of the wild honeysuckle. Uh, do you remember your first kiss? You see, when you've, for the first time, fallen passionately in love, and she had your first passionate kiss in the middle of a woodland, your attitude to nature will forever be different from one when that would have happened in a nightclub. <laughs> but it's not only our personal experience that shape our attitude to nature. Another root is in the cultural context in which we grow up. Because cultural systems also hold views, also hold ideas, and they are transferred to us by our parents, our educators, our teachers, the books we read, the media we watch. When you're, as a child, mesmerized by a spider and your mother tells you to kill it, that shapes your attitude. I mean, you read in a newspaper that nature conservation stands in the way of economic development, that shapes your attitude. Now, we in our Western civilization have traditionally held the view that nature is a resource, that it's there for us and that we own it. And this idea emerged in the classical period. Aristotle, the great philosopher Aristotle, designed a hierarchy of natural things, a great ladder of being, starting with minerals, lower plants, higher plants, lower animals, higher animals, and finally humans, and stated that in this ladder of being, it is the purpose of the lower to serve the higher. Now, later classical philosophers translated this into the idea that the gods had designed nature to serve the highest being on earth, the human being. And that idea was adopted by Christianity and as such became very influ influential in the Western world. Some theologians claimed that God had created a day so that humans could go to work, and had created a night so that humans could rest, and had created fleas so that humans would not rest too long. <laughs> and the great British scholar Henry Moore wrote in the 17th century, God has created cows in order to keep, to keep beef fresh for human consumption. 
Now, most people in our society now do not think in terms of a god who designed nature for human purposes, but many people find it self-evident that nature is ours, that it's there for us to use. And this idea, I think, is, plays an important part in the ecological crisis, in the climate crisis, because we treat the earth as a commodity. We use it, we abuse it, we exploit it, we exhaust it, we destroy it. Now, not all cultural traditions held the view that humans are owners of nature. In the Jewish tradition, it is said that we humans do not own the planet, but that we're tenants of God's creation. And that implies that we should take good care of the earth, that we're stewards of the earth. And that image is also present in the Islamic tradition. And there are other attitudes. Not so very long ago, I was in Burma, and Myanmar, and at a certain moment, our car broke down in the middle of nowhere, and we reached a small petrol station, and we had to wait for another car to pick us up. And at a certain moment, a snake slithered across the road. And the owner of the, of, the, of the petrol station grabbed the stick and ran onto the road. And what do you think he did? No, 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 no. He used the stick to carefully push it across the road so that it would not be killed by a car. You see, many Burmese are Buddhists. And for Buddhists, animals are fellow creatures that also have a right to be there and should not be harmed. They, they are considered other than people, persons. That's what Native Americans called plants and animals. Of course, they're not people, but they're persons. They're beings with a personality of their own. And this is another attitude. This is the attitude of partnership, humans and nature in partnership. Now, I may ask you, who feels that we own nature? <laughs> who feels that we're stewards of nature? No one? who feels that we're partners of nature. I would still like to carry it one step further. In all these images, owner, steward, partner, there's a separation between humans and nature. They're separate domains. But can we separate ourselves from nature? Can we exist independent of nature? Are we not in every breath we take connected to the plants that produce uh, oxygen? Are there not all kinds of minerals in our bodies that originate from the rocks of this earth? And do we not feed every day on the products of nature? We cannot exist independent of nature. That's why some philosophers has, have claimed that we are not entities in this world, but entities of this world. And the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh speaks about interbeing. Nothing and no one can exist independent of all the rest. We exist because all the rest exists. And therefore, we inter-are with the world. And that means that our personal well-being is intimately linked to the well-being of this earth. And this is an other attitude. This is the attitude of participation, of interbeing, of interconnectedness. And that is why I'm standing here, and that's why I'm holding this talk. You see, I love the earth, and I care deeply about life in all its diversity. And it hurts very deeply to see the destruction that we humans cause on this planet. And I feel that we urgently need to grow in our understanding and also our experience of participation, of interbeing, and living accordingly to it. Only then, I feel, we can create a future, a sustainable future for ourselves and for all the life forms that we share this planet with. May I ask you, whom of you is optimistic about such a future? Raise your hands, please. You see, I pose this question to my students every year after a course. And year after year, I see the number of hands decrease. And when I then ask the pessimists why they hold such bleak views, they usually say, yeah, you see, I can try to live sustainably and with respect for the earth, but what difference does that make in the light of the global economic system, and the global <laughs> financial system, and, and the political system? And moreover, the world has become so complicated that I would not even know how to live sustainably anymore. 
what to buy, what not to buy, what to eat, what not to eat. And here I think we touch on another crisis of our times, a crisis that I find very worrying. That is the sense of powerlessness. Many people feel that as individuals they have no impact on the future anymore. But are we so powerless? You see, if you understand participation and interbeing, you see that we are connected to this world in numerous ways. And that in everything we do, in everything we say, and I even would say in everything we think, we impact on the world around us. We are not without power. And that point was brought home vividly to me a few years ago when I was at a conference where a young couple approached me with a little boy and I said, may we introduce our son to you? And I said, of course, and I said, this is Matthias. And I said, yes, that's a nice name, isn't it? And then I said, no, 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 he has been named after you. After I, uh, a little worried, asked, do I know you? And I said, no, 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 <laughs> you do not know us, but five years ago, you were at a meeting where you cited a verse spoken by the Buddha. And that verse is, may all beings be happy and secure, whether big or small, weak or strong, born or yet striving to be born, may all beings be happy and secure. And this young couple had just heard that they were pregnant. And they had decided not to have the child because they felt too young to become parents. And when they heard these words, may all beings be happy and secure, born yet striving to be born, they looked into each other's eyes and at that moment wordlessly decided to let the child be born. Now this changed my life. Because that's the moment I realized what participation really means, what interbeing really means. By simply choosing a verse and citing it, a human being was born that otherwise would not have been there. And had they not told me, I would never have known. So we're not without power. We constantly touch the world simply by being here. But we very often do not see how we touch the world. And of course, no one of us will be able to change individually the global economic system or the global financial system. And the question even, if, even is if it should be changed or can be changed. There are emergent complex systems that we cannot even unravel anymore. But each and every one of us can become a new system. By simply living a life from a deep sense of connectedness, of participation, we will form a resonance that will affect everything and everyone around us. And of course we will make mistakes, and of course we sometimes do not know what to do. That doesn't matter. The essence is the intention. That intention will create a resonance that will touch other people. And when more and more people start to resonate in similar tones, a new system will form and will simply replace the old system. Certain um, social scientists claim that when 25% of society have changed their world view and act accordingly, a tipping point is reached. A paradigm shift will happen and society will change in one big way. Now, I think it's safe to say that we've reached about 10 or 15%. 10 or 15% of our society are already trying to live sustainably. Only 10% more needed. Now, if each and every one of us now tries to live from a deep sense of connection to all life, the tipping point is reached in no time and a wave will form. Let's start now. Thank you.